Hello and welcome to part four of lecture 17 where we're going to go over a few examples that illustrate thin film interference. Okay, um, so but we left off last time looking at the formulas that we're going to be using for interference and really it's all about these two formulas and knowing when to use them based on the phase changes. Okay, and on that note knowing the condition for the phase changes. That's the really the only thing you have to have practice with and make sure that you can quickly refer to and know how to do. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a first uh, the look at the first example. Um, you'll see that this was uh, almost more of a concept question, but let's uh, let's show how why it works. Okay, so let's imagine our soap bubble, something like this, right? And we're going to have light coming in. Okay, and I I always draw the light coming in at an angle. Um, I do that not because we you know really are thinking about light coming in at a particularly large angle because we want in this whole idea that the you know that the the rays are going to overlap the two reflected rays, um, but we do I draw it that way so I don't have to draw all the lines on top of each other. It's just kind of a illustrative convenience, you know. So that's why I always have it kind of come in like something like this, right? So let's have our first ray come in, all right, and then that's going to get reflected like this, all right. Following the law of reflection, some of it is going to get refracted and it's going to bend towards the normal. All right, so that would be something like this. So it'd be a steeper line, so maybe like that. All right, and then that's gonna get reflected at the next interface, like so. And of course, some of, some of that light will also um, be transmitted out of the soap bubble and continue on its way, but we're not concerned with that, okay? Um, so this is our incident ray, this is our first reflected ray, and our second reflected ray. We've got the soap. Okay, and so the soap is here. Okay, and I really should have called this question one. In fact, why don't I do that, right? Because it, it, you know, there's no numbers in here. It's really more of a concept. So question after the fact, right? Note, note to myself for uh, future naming of this this uh, example. Okay, and so anyway, so I had an N of the soap. And the only thing we really care about there is that it is larger than one, and then the N of the air is effectively one. Okay, and then we got air over here as well. Okay, so we care about um, the fact that we have air on both sides, even though I didn't um, say that I cared about the further transmitted ray. And we, we care about that because we need to know whether there is a phase change at the reflection on the, um, on the way out, on the bubble to air interface. Okay, um, so the two superimposed rays are going to be these two here, right? These are the ones that are going to potentially interfere with each other. Well, they're always going to interfere with each other, but they're going to potentially interfere destructively um, or constructively for that matter. Okay, so let's go ahead and put a label on those. All right, so these are the interfering rays. There we are. All right, so. What's the idea then? Well, the idea is that how many reflective phase changes in order to get a um, lambda over two, um, you know, um, wave, uh, a phase difference of lambda over two, right? So how many, you know, how, how many, no, let me rephrase that. How many reflective phase changes are there where the effect of the phase change is half a wavelength, is pi radians? Okay, so that's that's kind of the question that I want want us to ask ourselves. So how many reflective phase changes in this case? Okay, that's always a good question to ask yourself, even when you, it is a numerical example as opposed to this uh, more um, qualitative one here. Okay, well let's look up at the rule. Right, we know that there is a reflective phase change. All right, so there is a reflected phase change when we go from lower to higher, okay? So where the new index of refraction is higher than the previous one, okay? And so that's what we're looking for. This, are there, first of all, are there any? Well, when we go from the air to the soap, that definitely would involve a phase change, okay? So one phase change, all right, just a reminder that that phase change is pi radians. In other words, half a wavelength, okay? At the transition from air to soap. So we'll just say at 
air to soap. Because it because that meets the criteria, right? N of soap is larger than N of air. Index of refraction of soap is larger than index of refraction of air. There. Okay, that's it. Now, would there be another one at the soap to air interface? No. Okay. And just that one. <clears throat> and the reason is because they were going from higher to lower. And that doesn't create a phase change. You know, it's kind of like almost, it's, it's more of a rule, but it kind of reminds me of the same way we think about total internal reflection. Because if you have a wave that's going from um, higher to lower um, index of refraction, then we know that total internal reflection is possible. But you can never have total internal reflection, reflection if you're going from lower index of refraction to higher index of refraction. Then it never, will never happen. It is you know, physically impossi impossible. Look at Snell's law. And so that, that's kind of a good thing to remember, like, you know, even though we can always just refer to Snell's law. Um, in this case, we don't really have a, a law that tells us. We just have to straight up memorize it. Um, but it's still a similar principle in that, you know, there's this case that we know sometimes it can happen, sometimes it can't. All right. So where am I going with this? Well, let's wrap it up. Okay. So then if you think about it, then what is the minim minimal thickness to get destructive interference? Well, it's actually zero, right? So thus... m equals zero, because remember both the formulas above work for m equals zero as well as one, two, three, four, and so on, okay? So it's any, any value, any int integer, n is zero as well, okay? So then if we think about it, we'd have, what case would we be looking at for um, destructive interference? Well, we have one phase change. We're looking for destruction because we were asked for the minimum thickness to get destruction. And so that means we're gonna use this formula, right? So this is all I did. Check the number of phase changes, check that I wanted destruction, took me to the right formula, okay? And so in that case, with an m of zero, because that would be the minimum case, I then have two times t, t measured in meters, representing the thickness, okay? Equals zero times lambda. Well, that just tells, tells me that the thickness of zero. Thus, t equals zero. How do we interpret that? So this tells us a very thin thickness In other words, t much, much less than lambda would, because that would be effectively a zero thickness, would create um, destructive interference, okay? Would create destructive interference, okay? And that's what we wanted. So really our answer is no thickness at all or at least something that a thickness that is significantly smaller than the wavelength of light, okay? Um, is that possible? Sure, right? You could have some sort of nano thick, thick film, right? That would be, you know, 10 times thinner than the, uh, the wavelength of visible light. And certainly then that would, would cause exactly what we want. Destructive interference for that very, very thin film. All right, okay. So now let's look at another one just to get some further practice with this, okay. So in this case, we do have some values. Um, it, it looks like we don't have many values because we don't really need many to solve the problem, okay? So red light is viewed through a thin vertical soap film. At the third dark area shown, the thickness of the film in terms of the wavelength within the film is what? So take the wavelength of the red light to be 650 nanometers. So I'm gonna do kind of an extra step to set this up because we could kind of just jump in and be like, oh, let's just plug in M3 and so on. But I wanna kind of explain the interpretation of the problem. So you could think of this um, really kind of like a... Um, like a, ch a child's toy for blowing um, soap bubbles, right? Because it would have a circle like this, right? So it have you know this would be, this would be like the plastic ring, and if you were to hold that so that the plastic the plastic ring is vertically aligned, right? So like the y direction is up like that, then what's going to happen is the soap under its own weight is going to fall down, right? So then the soap at the bottom is going to be thicker than the soap at the top, right? You're going to have much thinner soap here because it actually will kind of have you know drip down because it's a fluid, of course. And so that means that there's, it's, you have a real thin section up here, okay? So thin that it creates constructive interference, all right? So essentially, what, did, what would that mean, right? Well, that would be constructive interference for red light. So that means it has a thickness where you have the light in phase, um, you know, for, uh, for the two overlapping rays. And then the first dark area is a thickness, it's the, it would be a thickness of M equals one. 
And why would we know that it would correspond to m equals 1? Well, for the reason that we just showed in the previous example, that when m equals 0 for air, soap, air, because that's only one phase change, you end up having a minimum thickness for destructive interference that's actually, well, zero thickness or significantly smaller than the wavelength of light. Well, that's not shown here, right? That would be, the idea here is that the soap was never able to get that thin, okay? And so that means that we want to assume that this right here is, has a thickness that ex is exactly, you know, allowing for the red light to be constructively interfered and so on, okay? So let's kind of write the formulas then. So what, what would be the correct formula? So first of all, reality check, there's a single phase change. Okay, and see the previous example. So single phase change, and that's going to be from air to soap. Okay, and we know why. Again, we just saw it in the previous example. Okay, and so that means that the first, uh, the red area here is construction constructive. So it's con. Constructive, and if it's constructive with a single phase change, consult consult the table here. That's going to be this one right here. Okay, so it's going to be two two t equals m plus one half times lambda. So two t equals m plus one half times lambda, and here this would be since that is the top where it would be the thinnest part of soap. That would correspond to a m of one. Okay, or excuse me, an m of zero. And so then our thickness is going to be, well, if you look at it, one quarter of lambda. All right? Because that's the minimum thickness that allows for constructive interference. And let's think about why that is. Well, because there's a phase change. So if it's really thin, the waves will just automatically, again, right here, right? They're just automatically going to be out of phase. Okay? But if it's thick enough to allow for a half wavelength in, Maybe get a, a thicker pin for this. A half wavelength in and another half wavelength out. Well, that's going to be a total of an extra one, one half wavelength. Um, sorry, a quarter wavelength in and a quarter wavelength out. Well, that will allow for a, a total of an extra path of one half wavelength, which will exactly counteract the reflective phase change that would have made them destructive had the thickness been, well, simply too thin. Okay? So that's... That's what we're looking for, right? That's why we know that would be the minimum thickness, one quarter wavelength, okay? That's a good thing to think about. Minimum thickness for constructive interference will always be a quarter wavelength, as long as you only have a single phase change, okay? What if there's two phase changes? Well, that would be another example, right? Um, so, but soap is common. I'm gonna go ahead and actually add a little picture here too, right? You know, think about this, you know, because the idea is that, you know, we have a wave coming in. Don't need that, that thick, right? So I'll have it come in as a trough, and then we know that there is a reflective um, phase change here, so then it's gonna come out as a crest, okay? And so the idea is if this is so thin, right, if this is practically, practically has no thickness at all, so that's a T of approximately zero, then this ray as well, since it's, it gets reflective of no phase change, it would be, um, so then we'd have a um, basically a a cancellation, right? So it'd be it'd be exactly out of phase. So it's just going to look like this. All right. So this one would have, be coming out like so. All right. Canceling canceling out the other the other wave because um, essentially because we have um, just thinking about this because the air air to soap was where we had had the um, the change. And so get when it gets um, when it gets reflected, it's gonna get um, so it will get reflected out of phase like so. Okay, but if instead we have a thickness that allows for you know a quarter wavelength in, so a quarter quarter wavelength in and a quarter wavelength out, then we can counteract that that cancellation that destructive interference. Okay, all right. I think you all get it. So anyway, so then we're interested in the third dark area. Am I right on that? Is that what I wrote? Yep, so the third dark area. So I'm going to go down here. Okay, so that's, so I'm just going to continue the idea. I'm not going to show every step in between, right? We can say, oh, well, the first, first dark area, I'll show, at least show that one. So the first dark area, we want the, um, the conditions for just destructive interference. So that would be 2t equals um, m times lambda. Um, this is 
the, this would be an m of 1. And so then we're going to get that t is going to be 1 half of lambda. Okay, so that's the minim minimum thickness to, um, to allow for that, that destruction. Okay, um, okay. And then the third one, that's going to be a m of 3. Okay, because it started with 0. Now we're up to 3. And so this is 2t, I will say, with m of 1. Okay, and so then 2t equals m times lambda. And so, and m equals 3. And so that's going to give us a thickness of 3 halves of lambda. Okay, and that will, that will cause destruction. Good thing if you want to kind of practice drawing the waves and thinking about how you, if you have three halves of, of a wave going in and another three halves of a wave coming out, well, that's going to give you a total of six halves of a wave, which is going to give you, um, you know, your two full wavelengths, which allows, um, you know, allows for that, um, no, sorry, three full wavelengths, and will allow for that, that cancellation, allow for it to be out of phase. Okay, so then when we uh, solve for the results, because we're actually going to give a value here, it's just going to be 3 halves times 650 nanometers. All right, let's see what the calculator gives us on that. All right, 975 nanometers. There we have it. Right, very thin film, right? Gets the job done. All right, so here's another, um, this is, be the final kind of concept question that um, hopefully will make it very clear if it isn't already kind of this whole idea of, of counting portions of waves and then thinking about when, they're, when they get canceled and not. All right, so here we have a film with thickness T that gives constructive interference for light with a wavelength in the film of lambda F. How much thicker would the film need to be in order to give destructive interference? Now, it doesn't matter what the, um, the indices of, ref of, um, of re refraction are in this case. We just need to know that this is destructive, whatever that thickness is, based on however many phase changes there are or aren't between the materials. And so then, you know, what's, what does that mean for changing it, right? What if you make it thicker, how do we make it cause destructive interference? Well, essentially what we know is that we have two waves that are in phase when they're coming out of this material, right? So we might have a wave that's, you know, coming out as a crest, then it becomes a trough. And then we know that the, that's the first reflected ray, right? which I'll draw like this. Okay, so the ray kind of underneath the wave like that. And then the other reflected ray, the one that's caused by the second interface, well, that one needs to be in phase for construct, constructive interference. So that means that it would need an exact, you know, maybe like exactly one wavelength, right? So there would be, the way I drew it, it's, more, it's going to be more like two. That's fine. Okay, so then we'd have something like this. So what does that tell us? That tells us that based on this example, or the, this idea that I'm, that I'm building on, that I'm gonna assume, and I could have assumed a different value at the same result, I'm gonna assume that the thickness is one lambda. Okay, so this is assuming, with no consequences, just assuming that t equals one lambda. Okay, exactly a wavelength, because if that's, if that's the case, then it'd be one full wavelength in, one full wavelength back out. So by the time it returned without a phase change, because again, I'm assuming no phase change here, that it would come, um, let's see what it actually, yeah, so no, no phase change. So it's coming back out as a, as a crest. It goes in as a crest, comes out as a crest. Okay, um, and here I'll draw the, in, the incoming one as well then. Might as well. Eh, it'll get I mean, the, the idea is that, you know, there, this would be the incoming one, right? And there's, here's the reflection without a phase change. So, an important thing, they're in phase, okay? But how do I get them out of phase? Well, I'd have to make a little bit of extra thickness here, right? So I'd have an extra, call this like delta T for a change in thickness. And this little extra thickness has to be just enough so that when the, the second reflected ray ends up overlapping with the first reflected ray, they're out of phase. Well, what would I need then? I would need a extra half wavelength which means I need a extra quarter wavelength of thickness. Because if you think about then what, what that would mean is if I had, if it was a little bit further back, then the reflected ray without phase change would look something like this. So it's gonna come, it's gonna be a quarter wavelength, so it'd come up like this, and then like that, like that, like this, 
and then come in. So do I have enough? So I have, is that full, one full wavelength? Looks like it, okay. And so then when it comes out, it's then gonna be coming down like that. I need it to be actually coming as a trough, what did I do? Oh, of course, um, is that it would, so if I'd, I'd have a half, half wavelength in, so it would, it would travel, it would travel further. So it would look like this, right? So it would travel in, it would, it would have fit a, an incoming full uh, one wavelength, then it would go a half in like this. So now it's one and a half, and this is on the incoming ray. Okay, so let's draw that. Okay, and then on the reflected ray, so then the new reflected ray, which I'll go ahead and just draw down here. And so we'll cl clearly show it. Right. Maybe ob obvious to you, but I want to clearly show you. So then it's going to get reflected without phase change, again, based on our assumption. If we had assumed that it was getting reflected with phase change, it wouldn't matter. It'd still be, it'd just be a slightly different picture, same result. And so then it's going to, it's going to have, it's going to come back like this. Okay. And so then it will go, so we kind of come back down, fit a full wave in, come up, get a full crest. So then by the time it comes out, now that it's actually an exiting wave, it's gonna come out as a trough, which will exactly counteract the first reflected ray that's coming out as a crest. Total destruction. All right, send a little note there. Okay, all right, let's highlight it, something like this. All right, looks good. No, I didn't realize that. Can't use the highlighter tool to draw draw um, shapes, I guess. Okay, um, so, so I guess I will use the red then. And there we go. So total destruction. Sounds so dramatic, total destruction. All right, so then we see. A change in thickness of one quarter lambda results in destructive interference. Okay, so if the result was constructive, always thickening the film by one quarter wavelength, no matter how many phase changes there are, will change that effect of the film from constructive to destructive. Just kind of neat to think about. All right. All right, looks good. And then I just wanna show you all one last example and then we'll wrap things up. Okay, this has got another uh, very common type of problem that involves um, constructive and destructive interference. And that's because it, we get to kind of have a triangle in there and relate some ideas. Also, it's, it's a popular demonstration um, where you can get two, two sheets of glass and kind of place them together but as long as there's a small gap between the glass, the glass, then you're going to get um, kind of bands of destruction and constructive interference, which for white light in a room will look like kind of white bands and dark bands. Um, and the reason for that is because if they're, if they're placed together, that gap is probably not exactly uniform in thickness, or perhaps when you place those two sheets of glass together, you actually create a wedge, right? So you have one that's tipped on its end slightly relative to the other sheet of glass. And that's what we're gonna be talking about here. Okay, and I'll draw a picture. So two very flat glass plates, 26.5 centimeters long, are in contact with one, uh, one end and separated by 16.8 micrometers at the other. The space between the plates is occupied by oil with index of refraction of 1.22. The refractive index of the glass plates is 1.51. The plates are illuminated at normal incidence with monochromatic light and fringes are observed. When the monochromatic light, and again, it works with normal light in the room, which is you know, rainbow light, essentially, um, it's just less, um, less well-defined. When the monochromatic light has a wavelength of 555 nanometers, right, so we'll just kind of take that as typical yellow light, how many bright fringes are visible in the pattern, okay? All right, so here's the picture. We want a couple of rectangles representing our glass plates. So something like this. So here's glass plate one, okay? And here's glass plate two. Okay, close enough. 
Okay, looks reasonable. Okay, um, they both have that refractive in, um, index of 1.51. Okay, add that in for reference. Okay, um, we have oil between them uh, with the 1.22. Okay, and if it's filling the whole space, um, we know that at this end, there, there's no gap, they're touching, it's like a, a hinge essentially. Um, and at the other end, they have a gap of 16.8 microns. Okay, so obviously that's gonna give us a triangle. Put that in a different color actually. So 16.8 times 10 to the negative six meters, because that's micron is one millionth of a meter. Okay, so what do we want to do here? Okay, um, so we need to um, find a couple of things, right? So the, the one thing we kind of want to do, which is a bit of a kind of a, a preamble step, is we need to find the wavelength of the um, light in the material. Okay, because we can't we can't just use the wavelength. Um, as, as found in, um, in air, right? Um, we did that here, like with the, uh, with the soap bubble. I didn't give you the index of refraction um, of the soap bubble. So it's sort of, I was, um, I was treating it as not being um, significantly different than air, um, just, that it ha just that it was higher than air, just marginally higher. But if it's, if it's significantly higher than air, then that means that the wavelength is gonna be significantly shorter. So we need to find that actual truncated wavelength because that's gonna be the wavelength that the thickness would be some fraction of, right? So if we take, for example, three has a width of lambda, that's gonna be the lambda in the material, not the lambda in a vacuum or air, okay? Um, so something, you know, be a bit um, more careful with, but sometimes gets a little hand wavy for these more um, qualitative examples like, like example two. And certainly in example one where we weren't really looking for a number, we we're just looking for zero. So, but in this case it matters, right? So uh, what are we working with here? So one thing to think about is the, the ratio um, between the thickness, um, the distance x, and, um, and the, the height and the length. Um, so I'm gonna call this value here h. We also know the overall length of the plate. And we know that that's, oh, do that in blue. We know that that is, well, I think it was 16 centimeters. Is it that long? Um, 20, oh, even longer, 26.5 centimeters. So 26.5 centimeters, okay, that's the overall length. Um, so obviously a very, very, very small triangle here, right, the angle would be, would be tiny. Um, and the idea then is that we could form lots of smaller, similar triangles, right? So I won't, I won't keep these in the figure, but you imagine like I could form a triangle there that has the same proportions, I could have another one like this, and so on, right? So you can form any number of these, what are called similar triangles, right, that have the same ratio, and they, uh, they have the same, you know, same angles. So here, are, here are examples of them, okay? And the reason I bring that up is because we're gonna need that to answer the question about the uh, spacing between the fringes. Um, so, so let's mention that then in part A. So the ratio of thickness over X has to be the same as the ratio, ratio of H over L, right? Because H and L are the overall dimensions but at any one of those smaller, similar triangles, it'd be T over X, right? So T, T would be that variable thickness, X would be the variable length along the glass plate. And so that just tells us that T, the thickness, is gonna be X times H over L, okay? And we're gonna need that when we come back, back to things because that means that we need then to set that thickness equal to the correct condition for bright fringes, okay? And so, Right? And so that's, that's gonna be our thickness in terms of our given variables. And the thickness for bright fringes is, well, how many phase changes do we have? Okay, so we're going from higher to lower and then from lower to higher. So we should have a single phase change. So that means that constructive interference um, is going to be this one right there, okay? So constructive interference is going to be the two, two t equals one m plus one half times lambda, okay? 
So is t equals m, not n, m plus one half times lambda, but I divided both sides by two, so I'll write it as lambda over two. That way I can write the t by itself and set these two t's equal to each other. Um, now, again, that's because of the single reflective phase change. Let me get out of that. That would occur um, from the oil to glass. The glass to oil would not happen because of single. I know I keep doing examples with a single reflective phase change. Single reflective, but you can see this process would be the same for two reflective phase changes or zero. All right. All right. Um, so now let's go ahead and find um, lambda, and this would be lambda inside the oil. So now, quick side note, and lambda in the oil is just going to be lambda divided by n of the oil. Okay, that's just true of any refract refraction problem. And so then that would just be our 555 nanometers divided by 1.22. And again, that's because when light passes into a transparent material, its um, frequency doesn't change by conservation of energy. But since it moves slower, the only thing that um, can change is its wavelength, and its wavelength is shortened based on that refractive, refractive index. Okay. And so that's 463 to 3 sig figs. All right. So now we're in good shape to actually um, solve for um, basically um, for our value of m because that will tell us how many how many bright fringes fit okay so let's see so um at, so what are the so the question asked uh, how many bright fringes are visible okay so to find out how many bright fringes are visible we may not even have to exactly set because i was thinking setting setting the thicknesses equal to each other would allow us to find you know, our particular maybe like a particular thickness for the the fifth bright fringe or something so that, that would be the usefulness of you know, having these two expressions for the thickness in terms of the geometry and the, for, um, the physical formula. Um, but in this case, if we just want the total number of fringes, we could actually set our thickness to h, because that's going to be our final h, and then just find out what m corresponds to that final h. So we're, kind of, we're, going to, we're using the approach, but we're, just, we're using it specifically for h. And so we'll say the largest m value will come from h equals, and then we just have our m plus one half times lambda oil over two, and then we're just gonna solve for m. All right, I need a bit more space here. Okay, and so when I go ahead and solve for m, I'll get m equals, and we got, okay, um, so h multiplied by 2 divided by the wavelength in oil, um, and then minus 1 half, okay, which won't make a big difference because we have a relatively high number here. Uh, but then let's plug in our h. Okay, so 16.8 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. Multiply by 2. Divide by 463. And make sure I have the right units here, because that's going to be 463 times 10 to the negative 9, because that's a nanometer. Good to remember. Okay, and then minus 1 half. And that gives me, um, if I round down, right, because I need to have the last fringe, and I can't have a half fringe, and I'm not going to round up because that fringe wouldn't fit on the glass. So if I round down to the first, to the, um, the, the nearest whole number, I get 73. So that's 73 bright fringes are how many, the, how many fit. All right. Put a box around it. That's our answer to part A. Uh, part B, I think, is a quick follow-up. Uh, part B says, what is the spacing between the fringes? Okay, so if we want the spacing between the fringes, then um, we're just going to, the, really, the best way to do this, and there's other, other approaches, you know, because we could just plug in an m of 1, right? So if I plug in an m of 1 into this expression, that's going to give me um, the thickness for the first one. Let's think. Um, oh, and then I could, then I could uh, find, then I could plug that thickness in, solve for x, 
then solve for the x, the x for the next thickest one, right? So I could find the two, two neighboring x's and then subtract one x from the other, okay? Totally fine to do it that way. Um, but it turns out it's not entirely necessary, right? Because we actually have the overall length. And so then if we have the overall length, then we can just take the overall length and divide it by 73. All right, so take um, m divided by l, which is just gonna be our 73, and we'll take the unrounded value and then divide that by l. Okay, so it ends up being 73.35, which you have in your calculator. And divide that by L of 0.265 meters. And that will give us 277 um, fringes per meter. Okay. And it wanted the distance between them. Well, then the reciprocal is going to be the distance between. And so then take L over M. And that just gives me 3.6 millimeters. All right, so there you have it.